It's time for my virtual Jericho with John Mayer. Welcome back after the Easter break. Um, remember, if you missed any of my Jerichos this year, just go to myjericho.co.uk and watch them and catch up. Hundreds do. If you miss the plans for the boatyard or Clive Myrie or St Barnabas Church, you'll find them there. It has been 50 or so in the last year. And still to come in the next month or so. Costumes for the local and county council elections on April the 21st and April the 28th. And after you've voted, we'll wheel in the winners on May the 12th. Plus a big, big treat. The county decides, well, finally, maybe, on the Walton Street barrier on April the 29th. My Jericho will relay that meeting live to the reaction from the many interested parties. It starts at 10 o'clock in the morning. And in May, a repeat of the very excellent Professor Gary Brown in tribute to Bob Dylan 80 on Dylan's birthday. Today, though, a genuine Oxford star uh, and a star of my Jericho, Professor Danny Dorlin. Last year, hundreds of you uh, tuned in for his take on Jericho from slum to the home of the liberal elite. Danny's unusual. He's a populist professor of geography, and that's not an oxymoron. He was conceived in Jericho, brought up in North Oxford. Today, he lives there after travels around the country in pursuit of the Holford McKinder Chair at the University of Oxford. He didn't, by the way, go to the University of Oxford. So sit back and enjoy it as Danny takes your trip around the Disneyland he calls North Oxford. Danny. Thank you ever so much uh, for having me. And I've got some slides uh, to show you, uh, so you can look at them uh, more than my face. And I should say, uh, Disneyfication is partly a provo being provocative, but I find it hard to come up with the word, as you'll see, to describe what I think has been going on in North Oxford. Um, as I say, <laughs> the alternative subtitle, if you're reading, is The Kenton and Chelsea of Oxford. Um, and then even more provocative, I'm going to end on why can't they share and what's happened in, in this city. So these are some ponderings for 25 or so minutes. Uh, my key argument is that something odd happens to the inhabitants of an unusually expensive area in the UK in the last few decades. People become increasingly sorted by money. When you have an original increase in inequality, as we had in the 1980s, yes, some people do better in some areas than others, but there's still a mix of people. And there was still a mix of people in the early 1990s in Jericho and North Oxford, say. But increasingly, that mix reduces because you can't get in unless you've got cash. So the area changes. Now, we know with inequality that we have many, many areas that are very poor. I could have shown you some of, of these caravan parks in, in the county of Oxfordshire, but I won't. We tend to talk about those areas. But then a few areas, not many, but a few areas that become very, very well off. Um, and it's what happens there, I think, which, which matters. So, testification is my word for kind of super gentrification. Uh, there's a picture, I think it's Euro Disney, this one. Um, you can have a look at the architecture. It's a kind of unreal uh, world. It's, it's a place that's seen as very enviable, that you want to go to, that tourists might come and see us, come and see the university and so on. You could come and stay for a bit. Um, I, I would love to see the 2021 census data for Oxford and North Oxford to see how many people have actually been there for how long and which countries in the world that they were born in. And I suspect that is even more cosmopolitan than it was in 2011 and then 2001. Things become inauthentic in an area that becomes disnified. So for instance, the canal uh, invokes great emotion to what the canal is used for, but we almost forget that the purpose of the canal was to carry coal into the city originally. That's long, long, long gone, as, as well as the pool that they the canal barges used to unload from has gone. So what does happen when you go down this route and where is it going and does it matter? And what are the implications for the rest of Oxford? Those are the kind of questions I'm interested in. Now, most of Oxford is gentrified. Um, I, I, my mum and dad started off in Jericho. They, they weren't poor, they were university students. They were doing maths and medicine which is why I'm interested in things like life expectancy. But they only had one grant. Um, one of them was cut off. So they had to survive on one grant. So in the 1960s, they lived in Jericho. Had me, 
and they moved up up to uh, next to County Centre because that was up, up market then. Then moved to Risinghurst, so Keddington was my area, and Henton was, was an average area in the 1970s, 1980s. But 20 years ago, the football ground was sold, the manor ground, and what replaced it? It's a big private hospital. And that's the kind of sign of gentrification that's going that was going on at the time. What does Wikipedia say if you just type in North Oxford to Wikipedia? Well, this is the picture you get. You get a picture of Park Town, which I think slightly architecturally looks a little bit like Euro Disney, but I don't want to upset anybody. And of course, you get to keep your red letterbox. But most fascinating of all, and, and somebody, not me, can uh, look at who edits this page on Wikipedia. Here's the overview of North Oxford on the Wikipedia North Oxford page. And it says the leafy road to Woodstock Road with the Woodstock Road to the west and Bramber Road to the east, leading uh -huh, to Woodstock and Bramber, respectively, run north south, uh, meeting at the southern end of St Giles Street. North Oxford is apparently noted for its schools, especially its private schools. And these include the Dragon, Summerfields, the Prep School, St Edwards, Oxford High for Girls, and St Clare's, which apparently has the longest running baccalaureate. Um, it's an interesting kind of way to describe an area. Um, those aren't the only schools, by the way, in North Oxford. Uh, but that is how Wikipedia now appears. I do wonder if it was an estate agent that edited it, but let's leave that aside. Um, so what do I mean about inequality and inequality rising and how that alters places? This is the basic fundamental measure of income inequality in the UK. It's it's uh, produced by the Institute for Fiscal Studies and the Households Below Average Income. And I'll show you some statistics from that uh, in a minute. But this line, which was at about 26 points in the 1960s, tells us how big the differences are between people in terms of income. And you're going to have to believe me, 26 was pretty low. It got even lower uh, when I was six or seven years old in the, the wonderful summer of 1974 is the minima. Uh, the UK was the second most equitable large country in Europe to Sweden. We were essentially Scandinavian. And then from 1978-79 onwards, this huge, huge increase in inequality through to 1990, the year when Margaret Thatcher had to resign. And that's Thatcherism for you. That's You all know what happened. And you could feel that depending on where you were in the country. But what people often don't get is it didn't end in 1990. That really high level of income inequality that we got to, one of the highest in Europe from one of the lowest, every year living with that, it's like living with high blood pressure. Right? It's, it's, it's worse and worse uh, for, for your health in some ways. And I think that somewhere like North Oxford changed most from 1990 to 2021 in the last kind of 30 years, because you have a small number of people with a lot of income and enough of those people want to live in the most exclusive part of a city that it drives the prices of house and the prices of schools up and enough people to justify building a large private hospital in the city 20 years ago. Here's some uh, data just to give you a summary because we <laughs> it's amazing how much we don't know about the country we live in. Uh, this is for children across all of the UK. Um, the numbers highlighted in yellow at the very bottom uh, show that 26% of all children live in the poorest fifth of households, then a quarter in the next fifth, only 15% in the top quintile, uh, the best off fifth. Um, so you could say, if you wanted to be disingenuous, that one reason that uh, children are poor, or got children that are poor, is that they live in poor households and they live in poor areas. Uh, we had a report last week uh, called the Disparity Report of Ethnicity that blamed ethnic inequalities on living in the wrong areas. And it would be as silly to do that as to blame children for living in the wrong areas. But that's our distribution of inequality for children. The other numbers are all the different regions of England. And Oxford is most similar to inner London. So we do have a high number of children living in poverty. Uh, and this is below 60% of uh, average income after housing costs in Oxford, but in the poorer parts, like in London, 28% of children in the poorest fifth, and then about a fifth in the next fifth. But like in London, if you look across 
uh, you'll see that 26% of children in London live in the richest fifth. And it's a bipolar uh, city in the same kind of way. What does it mean to live in these different fifths of households? Just quickly, because the more you're divided from each other geographically and socially, the less uh, you're aware of this. So that top uh, set of numbers is, do you have enough money to decorate your home? Uh, for children living in the best off fifth, so this would be most of the children in North Oxford, only 2% of their families don't have enough money to decorate their home. For children in the worst off fifth, it's 33%. Uh, the numbers I've highlighted in grey next, I think are often the most uh, shocking to people. And that's how many children can have a holiday and want a holiday, or their parents say they want a holiday. Now, in, in the best off fifth of areas, it's 96%. 4% can't afford a holiday. holiday. Holiday, by the way, if you want to know the definition, is going away from your home uh, for a week, not staying with family and friends. And this data comes from before the pandemic. So no need to say, oh, look, we're all poor now. We can't have a holiday. <laughs> the poorest fifth of children in Britain, 62%. And we've had this proportion for years. 62% would like to have a holiday but can't afford to, and they don't. The next fifth of children, 44%. So it's now very common, almost half of children in Britain don't have no holiday every year. And that's been getting worse and worse and worse. So I'm just trying to give you an idea of the stats. I won't go through whether people can afford home insurance or who can make 10 pounds of savings a week. It's the majority of families in poor uh, situations can't save 10 pounds a week. But interestingly, even in the best off fifth of households, 7% say they can't. And you might put poo that. You might say, how on earth can you be in the best off fifth and not be able to save £10 a week? Well, it could be quite expensive being in the best off fifth. Your mortgage might be very high. The school fees might be very high and you might feel obliged to pay the school fees. I'm sure you're fairly sick of those statistics, so I'll, I'll leave those. Safe to say that this data came out, I think it was last week or week before last when you was watching this. Uh, and what the minister concentrated on the government minister because this data has to be released every year by law uh, was what i call the black adder uh, measure of poverty which is the absolute poverty income uh, for those of you old enough to remember black adder and baldrick baldrick was the kind of very poor servant who was living in a sty and had nothing now if we go back to 1960 85 percent of people had very very little the kind of thing we used to measure then was do you have a spare seat if somebody comes to visit around the table? That kind of uh, thing to measure poverty. And by that measure of poverty, it's gone down, although it's gone down very slowly uh, more recently. What does the government do? Um, they release statements like this statement here. This is Theresa Kofi, the uh, Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, who says how wonderful things were. Between 2018 and 2019, a proportion of people below that Baldrick level, absolute low poverty, uh, reduced by 1% and so on. And you can read the rest of the text. Then, much later in her statement, she actually tells you the truth, which is that the statistics by the internationally recognised measure, i.e. living on below 60% of average income, got worse. This is before the pandemic. When the pandemic hit, it got much, much worse. February, March, April 2020. Unbelievable polarisation of incomes. Absolutely stunning. Um, who lost that money, who was furloughed, who wasn't. But I won't go into that. I'll just say you can be completely forgiven for not knowing that we're a country with mass poverty and inequality because government statements on things like inequality and poverty tell you how great everything is, despite that huge, huge inequality. So you could be sort of sitting there thinking, oh, it's fine. When people moan, they don't know what they're talking about. Similar to that report last week about ethnic disparities that told you that we were a shining beacon to spread across Europe in, in how, how good we are and so on. And what I find interesting about this is I do actually think that some government ministers actually believe this. It's not that they're being disingenuous. They actually don't know how things are. They don't look at the statistics. I haven't got the, the table there, but the households below average income. A majority of Pakistani and Bangladeshi children are in the poorest fifth of families. Uh, and that's almost all you need to know. But anyway, let's move on and get back to North Oxford and to Jericho. This won't, well, no, probably won't surprise you. It depends, depends exactly where you are. 
this is what I got from typing North Oxford into Zoopla a couple of days before recording this. And there you see a, a nice five bed semi going for two million. Um, and uh, then another five bed semi, which has actually got four reception rooms as opposed to two um, with quite nice brickwork going for only 1.69 million. But that's your kind of uh, prices for those. Two bed flats, 750,000 on Kingston Road. Three bed, but on the island, I think, so it might flood. Anyway, let's not talk about the flooding. Uh, 625,000. These are astronomical prices. As yet, there is no sign of them falling. To be able to afford to move in there if you are young, if you don't have capital, you almost certainly can't do it by your income because you will not earn enough to get the mortgage. You have to have gifts from family and friends and so on. And so it becomes a place that's increasingly concentrated by families with family money. But those, those are your prices for that part of, of the city. Um, and, you know, just remember, this was not that expensive an area in the 1960s. It was back in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, the next thing I did was simply type North Oxford into Google under news to see what stories I got out uh, at the very start of, of April, uh, what, what appears. And they're in the Oxford Mail. So there are three stories I'm going to give you of what's become normal, but I'm trying to tell you is not normal. The first is the celebration story that Oxford-based TSH architects have redefined the eastern edge of St. Edward's School. St. Edward's is one of those uh, boarding schools, private schools in, in the area, to complete the quad, which was originally planned in 1873, and you can see the stonework in the picture, uh, so that the school can now accommodate 700 students in the L-shaped centre, and the 1970s hall, which has been replaced, can seat a 1,000 people, presumably parents and students, but you never know, maybe even more uh, students before. Um, St. Edward's is the school that the man who wrote Wind in the Willows uh, went to. And in a way, we've returned to the kind of inequalities of his childhood. Uh, not quite as bad. Income inequalities are not back uh, quite to those levels, but they're heading there. And that's the disnification thing. We are going back to Victorian England differences between people, between families. The question is... Does it really matter or do you just say, oh, I'm a winner, it's fine, look where my child, well, I can afford to send them to school. In a place where the majority of children in North Oxford are going to private schools, very similar to Kenston and Chelsea, where the majority of schools are private, where the majority of hospitals are private. Second story. The second story, which I suspect people might be most interested in because you get the opposition to it, is this development round about the Wolvercote roundabout. Uh, which the City Council has finally signed off on as they've got their Section 106 deal, uh, which allows them to get 134 uh, council or housing association houses. 134 is not very many. That's a short street. Um, but that's, that's what they get for this development, which at Oxford College has sponsored, which will create 4,500 jobs uh, inside a city which already has far, far more jobs than it has people. What kind of opposition do you get to this? Where, when people say we're going to build um, office buildings and only a tiny number of, of social housing, and only then because we're forced to, not because we want to, the opposition you get isn't what you got in the past when Olive Gibbs, the famous Oxford housing campaigner and so on, said we needed housing for people to be able to live and work. The opposition you get is a campaign group which says that we shouldn't have this development. Uh, we should have, I think it's a forest there instead. And I think that's the kind of disnification of Oxford. You know, on the one side, you've got people who want to make lots and lots of money. And on the other side, you've got people who want to have a forest, which I'm sure would be very nice, but it's a forest within three or four miles of the centre of the city, the least affordable city in Britain. What are the 134 Council Housing Association rental homes for? Well, cynical old me can't help thinking that's for your people who are going to clean your site, isn't it? You know, and even then the city council has to insist on that so that your cleaners, your security guards, your porters don't have to drive in for miles 
outside. First story and final story. Uh, and if you like, <laughs> this is distification failing uh, because a group was set up. I think they only managed to raise about a million uh, to try to buy Tolkien's house. This is one of the homes, homes J.R.R. Tolkien lived in in Oxford. He wasn't, I don't think, a professor at this point. Um, he was basically a university lecturer, but way back in the 1930s, 1940s, a university lecturer. That's the kind of house they could live in. I'm not bitter. Um, he says, in fact, I bet the heating bill's really high. But that house was sold on the private market and went for about five million. And who has five million? What connection with the city do they have? Very unlikely to have much of a connection with the city. It becomes a place. North Oxford becomes a place where you buy your trophy homes. Um, you come in and out. It might be very convenient if you want to walk your children to the dragon uh, when they're young. But the, the number, proportion of people who can afford homes and houses at this kind of price is very small. And they're not going to be local. So it becomes, I can't think of a better word than Disneyland, but a kind of Disneyland for the global super rich, if it carries on as it is. So what might change it? And, and I'm getting towards the end here. The kind of things that could change these three stories, and eventually it will change, but the question we don't know, will it change in the next 10 years or the next 100 years or the next 200 years? It always does change eventually. On the schools, the number of parents who want to or who can afford to send their children to boarding private schools may fall. Uh, we saw a hint of that in the 2008 banking crash. Um, we saw a hint again with, with Brexit and then with the GDP fall with the pandemic. Um, if we had any reduction in income inequality nationally, but we may need it internationally, depending on where these children are coming from, uh, then there'll be fewer parents who can afford those kind of fees and that kind of stonework on the edge of a quad and, you know, costs a lot of money. Or there could be a change in fashion in parenting. And that's certainly affecting some boarding, some parts of the country. It becomes unfashionable to send your children off to board. But I wouldn't hold your breath, uh, but I would watch out. You know, this idea of North Oxford being this kind of economic agglomeration cluster for private schooling may not last forever. Secondly, those kind of North Oxford developments of offices. Well, I don't have to tell you what effect the pandemic has had on commuting. But suddenly our 40,000 people who were driving across the green belt, belching out carbon every day because they couldn't afford to live in the city but had to be in the city to work, they're working from home. Uh, so if they can work from home, do you really need all those offices round about the Wolvercote uh, roundabout? But other things might change this. Uh, the economic downturn that we're in and may well become worse when furloughing ends. Or the out-migration of younger adults from the UK, which we're not sure about, but we think people have left for the mainland of Europe, possibly in large numbers. We're not very good at counting uh, people. And lastly, lastly, what about that five million pounds for a house? Well, house prices have fallen before, but quite a long time ago. You have to go back to the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s to see the top end house prices falling because the number of people who could afford to buy at that price and afford to heat and maintain reduced when the UK became more equal, when Oxford became more equal. And when the number of people who can afford to buy those houses reduces, it's not just that fewer people can afford to pay that amount of money, but those people who could don't want to because they'd be buying an asset which would reduce in value. At some point it happens, absolutely no sign of it happening yet. Of course, there's always no sign of it happening until the second it happens. You don't get any warning uh, when, when these things uh, change. Uh, Notting Hill. Notting Hill, which used to be a very, very affluent area in the 1880s, 1890s on Charles Booth's map. Um, when that went socially downhill, when East Enders moved in during the war and where, when they rented out to West Indians, there wasn't a huge amount of warning of that. And of course, Notting Hill has now reverted to being very rich again going to end um, with a little anecdote um, and again I don't mean to annoy people but if you're wondering why, why should we worry about this this is fine it's just part of Oxford and okay um, it's becoming unaffordable to live in here don't know where it's going but but so what you should worry about poorer areas and people who are poorer uh, a friend of mine uh, 
tells this and she i say it's a she she said she's literally lost count of the number of times that people of north oxford have glared at her grumbled or shouted at me one right in her face just for walking or cycling the same space as them not for getting out of their way quickly enough uh, she struggles to understand what's going on she says she's quite clumsy and uncoordinated and she thinks she may be slower than others to get out of the way but the point is that she's willing to get out of the way and there's the rub other people aren't so what's wrong with them why can't they share why can't they say thanks why is their dog or child more entitled to space than me and this is now how her story ends one morning she was given a shocking insight and i was with her and she really was was shocked by this uh, there's a little boy lovely little boy on his way to school and he stopped uh this boy to let her friend through on his bike very polite moved out of the way bike went past and then she heard his father crossly tell the little boy bikes can wait too you shouldn't have got out of the way and she observed how aggressively this man had taken up the whole path ahead of his son and the little boy looked crushed he would behaved in a way his father didn't approve of he would put somebody else's need above his own he'd waited he'd been polite he'd shared and he'd been taught a lesson by his dad telling him off lesson for life you don't get out of the way of other people it's yours you've got a right to be there you've paid for that part of the city what are these people clearly from somewhere else doing moving through so i'll end here but my, my argument about why we should worry about this is that we tend to worry far more about poorer places and poorer people and talk about leveling up we don't worry about the effect that inequality has on the social life, the behavior, the amenity, the niceness of the places that look like they're the winners, the places that become more and more expensive. But the danger is, and I'd argue this, and I think you can go back in British history and see it uh, before at times of great inequality, things get worse in terms of what really matters in the places that disney as well as the places that fall apart. Thank you very much for letting me rant on. Thank you. Uh, very um, uh, impressive, Danny. You know, lovely phrase, Disneyfied. Which is the most Disneyfied part of North Oxford? Do you think? I would say it's probably the part nearest to the uh, university. I was trying to be because I work for university. I'm trying to be very polite. Um, but that's quite interesting building, the Blavatnik building, uh, and around there. You know, it's kind of slightly James Bondy. Um, so I, I would say down there and, you know, very nice, but very expensive restaurants and very small, very pretty terraced houses, workers, workers, terraced houses, uh, now at an absolute premium. And, and that's a very odd thing uh, to see. So the observatory quarter is a sort of example of a, of a Disneyfied area with a new humanities building as well. When mm. that goes there. Yes. Where you'll be working. Will you not? Will that be, will <laughs> uh, no, no. Geography's a science. So we're in the we're in the science block. We claim, but no. But it, it, will be, it will be very nice to work to work there. And of course, it's it's where the old Radcliffe, um, old John Radcliffe Hospital was. Um, so, and this is a common story for Oxford. So, at my college, St Peter's, is where it was the girls' school for the city, and the boys' schools at the other end. So, things which were for the city. Well, admittedly, that was it was a grammar school. So, only for some people in the city things that were for the city as a whole, and the same with the hospital, become only for part of the city, only for some people, partly the university, but also, if you like, uh, more and more for, for residents. You don't get that mix that you'd have had 20 years ago where you'd have some people still on those old secured tenancies paying, paying a tiny rent. Uh, and you'll have heard these stories, you know, paying almost nothing because they hadn't gotten a short, short old tenancy. You know, and you could say, oh, there's still a mix on our street. That mix goes. Every new person coming in is a professor or a doctor. I mean, and that's that's an agentified part of Oxford. You know, I, 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 I don't live in uh, North Oxford, but for a professor or a doctor to move in now, there'd have to be some serious family money as well. But, I mean, your, your college, uh, St. Peter's, has actually bought the Conservative Club and is turning that into, into college, isn't it? Into, into accommodation for students. Yes, Isn't yes. Right? Uh, 
it is right although it's um it's, it's quite funny you know there are many things that you could say it's a terrible that this building has been taken and is being used for this but given my personal politics i'm quite happy for a conservative club to go now, but very interesting what more being a bit fairer uh the, the conservative club went because it didn't have enough members because the kind of person the small business uh person local traders who would have gone into the conservative club and actually joined were disappearing from oxford uh, so it still had enough people drinking but only just but not enough members for, for it to survive as a conservative club and again that, that's a kind of telling change in the city let's take one road for example in north Oxford, st margaret's road you know house prices are high there because the former director general of the bbc always has still has a house there i mean i know a yeah. tv executive who better remain nameless who bought a house there and spent a million pound doing it up because she she wanted her to, her children to go to the dragon and when the, when the children didn't get into the dragon she flogged the house yes i mean does that sort of thing surprise you well it doesn't surprise me and, and and that's what it's like now uh but actually this is completely truthful so margaret's road is the road on which my mother rented a room which my father could climb through the window of i was being told because and he wouldn't because, because way back in the in the 1960s the people who owned those houses on St margaret's road didn't have enough money to maintain the houses and had to rent out rooms to students and so this is incredible change that's, that's occurred over 50 years um and it's what you get is a kind of lack of community um because you have an increasing number of people who don't just own on st margaret's road they'll own a nice little place in devon and they might own a flat in london in the barbican and they might have somewhere abroad as well in france and so what you'll see and you see this much more obviously in affluent parts of london is that the lights are off the lights are off at night unless they're on some kind of burglar thing to try and pretend that somebody's there and and that that makes it less of a place i think in, in some ways when we talk about social mobility park town you know one of the better known residents of park town is a former arsenal footballer as i think you probably know who, who, yes. who, who in some ways has gone on like a bucket of cold sick in park town <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he's gone from Cowley to Parktown. Surely he, he's done well. It could do well, but does it make, you know, when I look at the sizes of some of those houses around Parktown or Winchester Road, I kind of think, what would, a, what, would it, what would they look like in a more equal country? Say, if we, had, if we had the level of equality of Germany, for instance. And being so near to the university there, what would have happened, I think, is that a, a lot of these houses you may find it's impossible to imagine uh would be rented out to students uh you may well have students sharing two to a bedroom and they'd be spilling out onto those steps at the front of the houses uh, and you'd you'd have a kind of life around uh the streets um that you don't have uh when there's fewer people and particularly there are some very large houses around that area with just one person uh living in i mean it may be an apocryphal story but i was told about one house of nine bedrooms with a single elderly but very very well off um resident and clearly people like it they wouldn't pay the money to be there but it's a it's a lower number of people actually living there whenever we can measure it the highest proportion of second homes in oxford are in that area this is this is people uh declaring it's their second home to slightly reduce their council tax a tax which is pretty minimal given the amount of money you need to maintain a house like that it never never ceases to surprise me how really really well-off people desperately want to pay less tax if they possibly can but but, but um, the university is part of the problem is the whole area up the woodstock road has now become a sort of a student ghetto with lots and lots of new developments being built by, by colleges are they not partially responsible for the identification uh the university is certainly part of this um and and it could be much worse i mean all it would take is a, a release of the number control on postgraduate students um and it, it you wouldn't want to think what would happen in just a few years time um 
in terms of if if university departments were allowed to take more masters and phd students uh, most of whom um, many come from abroad and can fly in through Heathrow, uh, then we would would see an incredible super gentrification increase um, but the slow expansion of, of and not just oxford university uh brooks as well which kind of pushes the old university away from headington because brooks is taken over that area uh, and Brooks, as you may know, managed to hit the headlines, was it a year or two ago, uh, for actually being even further from its uh, targets from Ofqual for how many children from normal social backgrounds it should be taking uh, than the University of Oxford. So you combine these two uh, universities and it's interesting to kind of think what happens as a city when this carries on. The, 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 the bottom line for me about, about why it's a crunch point now is that between the 1980s and now, the number of people working in the car factory and associated uh, factories reduced from about 40,000, most of them had families, to about 3,000, mostly without families. And the hospitals and universities expanded into their homes. They've That's gone, and that's why we suddenly uh, see a situation uh, that rapidly gets worse each year more, more quickly. And because of a lack of memory in the city, because so few people can actually be born here, stay here, live here and see it. People aren't aware that that is why it was possible for the universities and the hospitals and, and Formula One, a few other things to expand, because they were filling the houses of car workers. But eventually you fill all the houses of car workers, uh, which is the position we've, we've got to now. But your title says, is it inevitable? I mean, is there anything that can be done apart from those three social changes you outlined at the end? Uh, I think that the university and the colleges need to need to think very seriously about the aggregate effects of, of it's always tempting to get a little bit bigger everywhere. <laughs> it's it's a bit like yeah. having an extra chocolate bar, you know. Um, each one is, in, you know, so, so that's certainly something that can be done. I think the council needs to become more ambitious. Um, now, councillors will probably be hitting their head against the wall saying, Danny, you could help more yourself. Um, but I think the level of ambition of the city council has kind of been battered down uh, quite a lot by what in theory is possible by the Section 106, by the fact the Secretary of State can overrule anything anyway. But I would like I would like a longer term plan. And, and because, you know, a lot of the energy the council is dissipated by, and you know, rightly, but arguing about blocking Walton Street, which matters a lot to the people on Walton Street. But if, if you're spending all your time worrying about each of these individual small things to a city, thinking, how can we, when Oxford goes to 200,000 people, how can we do that in such a way that people are not having to share several families to a, to a house on Moral Avenue? You know, those are the real things that the council should be thinking about. But they're having to deal with these individual smaller issues um, rather than... Rather than are the hidden problems and they're partly hidden because people are very embarrassed about their their situation they don't come forward uh and tell you um but we know i could show you i should have put it up if you look at the covid map um i've looked at just under 200 people died of covid in, in a pandemic in oxford uh the majority 102 of those deaths occurred since january the first of this year and most of them in a couple of weeks early this year and we have a map of the city of the rates of cases across the city then and the rates in little more uh, blackbird lees and rose hill and barton are eight times higher than in north oxford and the deaths will be eight times higher uh, and why are, why are, why was the pandemic of oxford so unequal it wasn't just that people actually had to go out to work there's almost no unemployment in oxford almost every adult works it wasn't that just they had to go out to work, their jobs couldn't be done from home. It's that people were so crowded in their houses in the poor parts of the city and less crowded or they'd left. They weren't even in Oxford in the more affluent parts of the city. And, and so the, the legacy of the pandemic is this map of incredible inequality over who actually became ill and who, who died. Um, and that that's, that's a kind of testament to the unequal city that we live in at the moment. You compare that to when flu hit Oxford in 1968-69 and went through and 
it, it went through um, far more equally, but they actually um, they vaccinated the car workers with a vaccine I was told it may not have worked very well, uh, but, but, but helped encourage people uh, to carry on going to work rather than say they felt ill, which was a bit ingenuous of the people running the car factory. So you're saying be ambitious, you're saying more Section 106? I mean, let, let's take Edward Lucy Way, I don't know if you know that, across the yeah. canal on the way to Port Meadow. That's got a, a third social housing, two thirds private housing, and it's the British class system in miniature. The two sides, yeah. the, the two sides don't meet. Is, is that the way to do it, or it's more ambitious? It's you know the councils were talking about fifty-fifty, given how depleted it is in the city. Um, it is having a plan for when, like in the nineteen seventies, house prices fell. At some point, they will. will for the, House prices are nationally only so high because the government spends more money trying to pop up the housing market than anything else. Help to buy is help to keep house prices um, high. But at some point, you can't have these incredible, the high houses because we won't have it. We don't have enough people to keep on buying, or you know, unless we make people pay enormous rents for the whole of their lives. It, the, the game, the Ponzi scheme, will end at some point, and you can have a plan for that point. And it's happened before. Uh, and purchasing at auction at the bottom of the market you should think about it and, and, and be ready uh, for it you can be more ambitious you can talk about at some point will you move the low-rise hospitals out from the city onto green fields on the edge of the city so that if you're lying in the churchill you've got a nice view of a hospital of a, of a city from your hospital bed but also that that low-rise hospital land could be used for housing all kinds of things are possible it's harder to do things in Oxford and elsewhere. I lived for 10 years in Sheffield, watched incredible building in Sheffield, even more in Doncaster. Um, <laughs> the, fact, the fact that it was possible to build homes in parts of the country where there was less need for homes. And then I come back to Oxford and see that almost nothing, apart from West Barton, Barton Park, almost nothing had been built in decades was, was shocking. Um, but one last thing to sort of say on this issue though, and the pandemic, it's interesting. We did make lots of people come into the city for eight or nine in the morning to be present. Uh, and they come in for Bista and Didcot and Whitney and so on and fill up the roads. A huge number of those jobs can be done from home, can be done remotely. If the university and the hospitals and other businesses give people a choice after the pandemic not to come in, that could cool things down in terms of the Oxford housing market a little bit because you won't necessarily have to do that commute every day twice a day into the city you can just come in say two days a week uh, from one of the outlying towns and then the desire to live in the city will be less the houses become uh, cheaper in the outer parts of the city and that eventually you could get a sort of a, a, a trickle a trickle down in house price if you like not a trickle up uh, do you see a, a crash coming in, in, in the housing market in Oxford particularly? <laughs> um, there was there was a fall. Uh, if you talk to Oxford, well, if you talk to estate agents, most of them have only been in the job for a year or two, so don't know. But they'll tell you our house prices never fall. But they did fall 2008, eight nine, possibly ten. Um, so it isn't true that they've always risen, but in general, Oxford has been one of the ha hardest housing markets for for decades. Um, it never stays highest forever. Uh, I think that's the important uh, thing thing to realise. Uh, one reason I, I think for some of the developments around Oxford that have caused upset is that the Labour Party made a mistake when John Healy was shadow housing minister of declaring that it would help councils purchase agricultural land at agricultural prices on the edge of cities uh to solve housing problems and the obvious one was oxford and almost within days of john healy saying that various colleges that owned land around the city began to talk to developers we can see the effects uh, now and the problem is that what they build what maximizes the profit are often houses for people who you think are going to commute to london but then the question is are they because a whole load of people have left london and that not just because of the pandemic, although that's the most important the reason they've left London, but also because of Brexit. And this will have affected Oxford. If you think who was working in the cafes in Oxford, who was serving in the pubs, 
who was who was doing a lot of the basic work in the city it was people from mainland europe and you may find when things open up that many of those people from mainland europe are no longer here and that must have an effect now you know you actually you went to cheney didn't you the, 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 what, what one of the less elite schools in, but are you a bit, being a bit unfair in St Edwards? Uh, John Snow went to St Edwards. As, as <laughs> yes. well as Mr. Wind in the Willows. But in, in, of your contemporaries in Cheney, what sort of jobs have, are they now doing? So, uh, and, and Chris Whitty went to Pembroke College. I think I think we should also should celebrate Chris Whitty in Pembroke. Um, right. Uh, what jobs are, are they doing? Initially, my, my year of boys was the very last year that went into the car factory. So quite a few went in, but hardly any have survived. Uh, maybe one or two still 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 work uh, in the car factory. Uh, a lot went into plastering, that kind of work. Um, at, at that time, we have moved on to many different things. And almost all, 90%, left the city and haven't come back. Um, so, it's, so it's hard to know uh, what people are doing. Um, but they leave often with the intention of coming back. This was a tradition in Oxford. You would you would go out to the county where you could afford to be and then you'd come back later. But the problem was that the city gentrified. So if you look at the homes around Cheney now, um, the estate opposite is absolutely full of Brook students, which is where my friends used to live where there were family houses. Um, if you look at the moral estate onto the side, again, students, but also families absolutely packed in desperately uh, to, to that. So it, it's such a different city to the much more equitable city where we never we never knew how good we had it in the 70s and, and 1980s. Um, and what people, is, what is yeah. Sorry, finish off. Oh, and, and what is the people, way you, you finish, sorry, carry on. Sorry, and, and, more people were able to have holidays then. This is the sort of difference. The holidays might have been more boring, um, but more people were, were able to do them. Whereas now, when you look at about a quarter of the children living in poverty and people kind of just uh, getting by, it's, you don't get a complaint about it. Uh, people complain less, but spend their time in the city in a kind of temporary way. Fewer people are living for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years in the city than in the past. The idea of people going to the same school as their parents is reducing. Uh, I went, my, my, my primary school, my, I went to Donington first of all, and then Wood Farm. And I went to do a talk a few years ago to Wood Farm School, where almost everybody's father worked in the car factory. And I asked the children, do you know what um, people's parents used to do? And they had no idea about a car factory in Wood Farm School. Uh, and their parents were temporary workers, not particularly well paid in the city uh, from all around the world often. But they were here for a short amount of time, not settling down roots for a longer time. What was it about you that you were able to escape from Cheney uh, into the world of academia? Um, because I was the son of two Oxford graduates and in Cheney in the 1980s, that was very unusual. Only uh, a dozen of us uh, had parents who'd been to university, uh, which was not which was average. Um, that Cheney was and is uh, bang in the middle of state secondary schools. Uh, so about two percent, three percent of children at that time went to university. I was a child of graduates. Uh, my mother was a maths teacher. Immediately, you can see the great advantage I had. Uh, my dad was one of the GPs at Temple Cowley Blackbird Lees. I was the posh doctor's son. Um, and so it wasn't a, wasn't a great achievement for me uh, to go. Did you get beaten up? Did you get beaten up at Cheney? Did you have to sort of keep quiet until you got to six point? No, two reasons. Uh, one, I was tall and large, and that absolutely certainly helped. Uh, but secondly, and uh, because there was a, more of a community then, you didn't beat up the doctor's son, uh, actually, because, because there's always a kind of, well, you know, the doctor's absolutely essential. Um, and the doctor then would, you know, sometimes my dad would be on nights half the week and would drive out on in his mini, he had a mini, and he'd drive out in his pyjamas to people's houses because he didn't have time to get dressed. Um, 
you knew your doctor. It's it's sort of slightly like EastEnders and Doctor Leg. Um, so you don't you don't beat up the doctor's son. I was in a very very privileged position, but also I was big and I could fight. Um, and it wasn't. I my memories of of, of um, schooling is not not it wasn't particularly particularly bad. Uh, but people had an absolute fear that the really important thing back then for the middle class and those in the know is that if you could move your boy from Cheney to Magdalen School, you would increase their chances of going to, going to university 10 to 20 times. Massive. You know, from, from this tiny 2 to 3% chance uh, to a 40 60% chance. And so a lot of people, who, well, there aren't many, but if you had the money, you would put them into Magdalen, then they'd go to university. The huge difference nowadays is that half the children of Cheney are going to university. You actually get far less for your money <laughs> by paying for, for, for a private school. But we have a kind of lag of the advantage. So people think they're buying safety for their children, economic safety, whereas in fact they're going to have to find that they're going to have to pay for them to have a master's degree and then some other qualification at the end of university to give them some kind of degree of difference. And even then, the old school network and parents and all the rest of it and internships the kind of terrible corruption you need in an unequal country to give to give your child a chance to get into the top 10 percent uh, and this is what worries me this is why I, I talk about the problem with north oxford for the children of north oxford there are so few jobs that they can get which will give them an income that allows them to be able to buy themselves in and if there's two or three of them in a family they can't inherit it all uh, and so you end up funneling people uh, into particular routes towards finance or law that's what they have to do if if they're afraid to move down and at the most extreme it really matters who you marry because you don't want to marry out of your social class at a time of great inequality so that that freedom is is massively uh diminished and, and these are the kind of things i think we should talk about more rather than just talking about poverty and destitution and that side of inequality i think we should be talking about the disadvantage that inequality has to the fairly well off there's a story in one of your works about uh, coming across the the ring road under the ring road from risinghurst and um uh, the working class boys went one way and the middle class boys went the other way do you, do, do, do you remember that uh, yeah, yes well there's i went I, I went after after going to university and becoming a researcher. I went. I came back home, and Mum and Dad were still uh, living there. And I saw somebody had spray painted "bad puppies this way, good puppies that way." Now, in academia at the time, there was this big debate about whether there was something called an area effect. Could you prove with numbers and regression analysis that there was an effect of what area you uh, grew up on? And I partly felt this was just silly. I thought it wasn't that hard to, to prove it. But what I found really funny was that, was that a child had actually spray painted uh, this into, under a subway wall. Uh, and, and so I, I wrote it in, in an article. And it published in the year uh, 2000. And this is partly what I mean about that report on ethnicity that came out last week that, that tried to blame some of the differences between life chances of different ethnic groups on people's geography saying it's not because you're black or brown or whatever, it's because you live in this area that you're poor. But those areas were not always poor. Um, and it, just the same as you can't blame a child being poor on the area they live in. That is obviously isn't the reason. The same for ethnicity. We've got into a really warped way of thinking uh, and a dangerous way of thinking because it then heads towards this, oh, some people are much more able than others and you've just got to work hard and if you work hard you'll be able to afford that five million house <laughs> clearly clearly you can't and i'm not saying things were great when you know a lecturer in medieval english uh, could have a house with servants with a au pair i think from iceland um which if you're trying if you're reading lord of the rings it helps to know that tolkien has an au pair from iceland um you know i'm not saying things were wonderful back back then either um i'm just saying there was a time in between in the 60s and 70s when you could start a family uh, and it didn't matter too much what your social class was and you could settle down and have children in your 20s if you want and you didn't have to be paranoid about what school they went to. And for the, a short time, and this is why I think I was very lucky, 
when Oxford abolished the grammar schools and they all became comprehensives. And the school which was seen as worst was one called Charwell, which had been the secondly modern in the north. And the school which was originally seen as best was what had been the grammar school, the county grammar that became peer school in the south. And at that time, at that time, it made minimal difference which school you went to for a very, very short amount of time. And um, if you're thinking, oh, he's kind of harking back to, you know, rose tinted glasses, this is what is normal today in much of Scandinavia and other Nordic countries. What we actually had in the, in the late 70s, early 1980s, that social mixing we had is what people have today in large parts of, of Europe. And at some point, we'll probably get it again. It's just, you know, will I see it in my lifetime or won't I? Now we're coming towards the, the end, but I mean, you're very unusual. You, you're a Corbynista geographer. Are, are, there, are there many Corbynistas in, in, the, in who are professors of geography? Um, there, I, I suspect uh, it's quite funny because um, I suspect there are, there are a, a few. I, I'm happy to say that I, I did support. I still support the Labour Party. I, you know, I, my mum used to run Labour Party committee rooms. Uh, way back in the 70s. I knocked up uh, in 1974 twice as a six-year-old, which is highly effective if you're six. You knock on the door and say, are you going to vote Labour? It's, it's much more effective than having an adult knocking on doors. I, I, I know nowadays we wouldn't let a six-year-old knock on, on people's doors. Um, though I don't think I'm, I'm that un unusual in that. It's just for me, it isn't just an ideology um of doesn't that sound nice wouldn't free wi-fi for all make sense you remember that proposal which you think we could add or raising spending levels to average levels of germany i think made sense uh, and of course now our government had to do it in the pandemic it isn't just ideologically and theoretically and practically sensible to do these kind of things that were proposed then uh for me it's if we don't do that kind of thing then our cities are going to carry on being this divided. And then what do you do as a young person? Do you try and make as much money as you possibly can? So that if you work really hard for 15 or 20 years, you might be able to put down a deposit on a house, not in the area looked down at the most. And if you kind of step on other people's necks on the way up, you could just be okay. Or do you creep to the grandparents uh, if, they, if you've got grandparents with cash. It's, I don't want to see this country be one in which for somebody to be okay, they have to behave at some point in a way that will probably be um, immoral and, and not particularly nice. And that's what happens in very, very unequal countries. But we are the most unequal in Europe. You know, so we're at an extreme. Uh, in some ways, the only way, only way is, is up and it can get better because you can't do worse than being ranked that badly are you hopeful that north oxford will can turn around disnification the disneylanders will be a, a distant dream i yes it, it's just i don't know when um I, I i i think income and wealth inequality in britain is going to uh improve um sadly partly because we're in a kind of 1930s economic crash position where, when it when it got better before um we're just not making you know if you look at our economy we're keeping it alive with a furlough life support system not everything is going to come come back and the costs of uh goods from europe are absolutely going to rise the transaction costs so we're not going to become singapore on thames my worry for north oxford is does it become a kind of international hub for the world super rich to come to, to be in. You know, if you're a banker in the Cayman Islands, do you also buy or rent a flat in North Oxford? Do you send your children to the Dragon uh, while you're not other places? And that's my fear for North Oxford. It goes from being a place where the English elite used to live to being a place where the international elite have a home. And in some ways that would be worse than the old English, English elite. You'd have let even less of a kind of soul to a place if that were to happen um and increasing global inequality would bring that the world super rich have to settle somewhere their children want to get a degree from somewhere it matters them to, to a lot um and if they can choose they often look you know where are the house prices the highest 
you know, that must be the place you want to be. It's the equivalent of where Donald Trump lives down in Florida, you know, that particular set of streets and those particular set of houses. And then, then you attract people who've made enormous amounts of money and you don't necessarily get the nicest neighbours when the richest people turn up. And I think Norfolk needs to worry uh, potentially about that that being something that could happen but doesn't necessarily have to happen. And part of the reason you, you can stop that happening is by making sure that you provide more mixed housing, that you, you don't um, allow people to become uh, more segregated, to get rid of footpaths, uh, to, to carve land out from public access uh, that allows them to create, if you like, estates for multi, multi, 30, 40, 50 uh, millionaire millionaires, not, not your bog standard millionaires. Uh, and that's so, the thing so, I would worry about. So your, your basic message is watch, watch out for the Russians and the Chinese. They're coming up the M40. Um, as, as ever, Danny, um, uh, wonderfully thought provoking. Thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, I'm sure the, the hundreds who watch this will appreciate it. Uh, and c come back later in the year or next year, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll carry on uh, the social analysis of, North, of North Jericho and North Oxford. Just a reminder for those those who, who missed the beginning that next week, the 21st, it, we'll be talking to county council candidates from North Oxford about what uh, what what their their, their plans are. Uh, at the moment, we don't seem to have any Tories who want to, want to come forward. I don't know what, what, that, what that tells you. And then the week after that, it will be the uh, the candidates from the um, local council elections, Fox and City Council, the entire uh, council is up for grabs there. And then two weeks after that, we'll we'll, we'll talk to the winners, but in, be in between as well, the, the Wharton Street uh, fiasco, Farago, call it what you like, mm -hmm. D-Day, the council will decide what, what they're going to do, or maybe they won't watch this space but thank you very much and see you all next week cheers bye bye Yoo